My name is Roxanne Black Weisheit. I'm from Friends Health Connection. And I want to thank everyone for joining us for our webinar on becoming a blood donor presented in collaboration with Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, Somerset. Did you know that donating blood can save up to three lives? During today's webinar, we'll learn more about blood donation, who can be a blood donor, the benefits, and donor safety. We're pleased to be joined by our guest, Nicole Greco, blood donor recruiter at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, Somerset. Nicole, could you raise your hand? Okay, great. And Cynthia Myers, who works in the blood bank at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, Somerset. So welcome to both of you. Um, okay, I'm gonna shut off here and turn the attention to you. So first, could you talk about the need for blood donations? How much blood do you need each year for patients at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, Somerset? So each year we have about 1,200 patients and they require 4,000 units. So that could be whole blood or blood components. The need is it could change and it could happen at any moment. It's a, it's a split second thing, um, the, the circumstances that often bring someone to need blood. Um, so we, we encounter that a lot and, and Cindy and I are here to really speak to the importance of having a, a well-stocked, fully prepared, ready, ready to go blood bank. Uh, the most valuable unit of blood, in my opinion, in mid delivery is the one that's already on the shelf, ready to pull at a moment's notice. Um, just to give you an example of how quickly this can change and can quickly develop, um, there, was a, there was a mother in Texas, a, a woman who had a very rare childbirth complication, and she ultimately needed 35 gallons of blood. That's over 540 units. So hospital blood banks need to be ready and able to act at any moment. So nationwide, someone needs blood every two seconds. In New Jersey, of all the people who are eligible physically who could donate blood, less than 3% of them do. So the challenge is we're trying to recruit blood donors in a very busy state. There's lots of people here. They just are, culturally are not giving blood. The ones that do, do. And it's a tremendous thing. And, and we're so, so proud to welcome them here to our blood donor program. So how much of the blood that you need are you able to supply through your own blood donations? On average, the hospital uh, is able to, to provide 80% of what we use. Of course, we always want to get that to 100%. And so the onus is always to keep people coming in during the year steadily through times of shortage. And in the, the, the blood industry, the major and main times are summertime and during the holiday season. Now that's in general, those are, those are ones that we can predict, but if we have stretches of really inclement weather or if let's say we have a, a bad flu season, those times can stretch out and, and go longer than we plan. Who could donate blood? Typically, as long as you're feeling well and healthy, um, we take people from ages 16, and unlike other blood collection organizations, we don't have an upper limit in terms of age. It really has to do with whether or not they can fulfill the, the medical requirements that every blood donor has to, has to go through. So if you're feeling well and healthy, you weigh at least 110 pounds or 120 pounds. If you're 16 years old and you have parental consent, then you're welcome to come in. Uh, we'll discuss medical and travel eligibility on a per person basis in a confidential setting. So the people who work in our program know this inside and out. We deal in this every single day. And so there's really not many, many questions you can throw at us. One thing I find that that's particularly um, interesting is that most people, when, when you meet with them face to face, they tend to want to self defer oh, I, I have this condition, or I've been this place, or I heard that if you got a tattoo 10 years ago, you can't donate. These things aren't true. The eligibility does change from time to time, but there's this kind of natural self-limiting behavior that I notice among people who might want to donate but might be a little nervous about it. Really, the best thing you can do is you can give us a call or you can come in and, and see us. We'll, we'll talk you through what you need to know. Okay. 
I, I have to ask you personally, like, uh, I'll just give you my own situation. So my husband donates a lot, but they do blood drives at his work. So my first question is, if an organization or a group, maybe a church group or a company or a small business wanted to have a blood drive, how do they go about doing that? Wanted to offer one. Oh, absolutely. And that, that's always music to our ears. We love being out in the community and it's a wonderful way to interact with, with people who can see and understand that everything we collect at Robert Wood Johnson stays with our patients. Other organizations that you might be familiar with in the community, maybe you see their trucks on the road or, or you see their advertising other places, it's, they, they sell the blood to to hospitals. Uh, there's no saying it stays in our region. It's an industry, but everything we collect stays within our patients. It goes to Cindy and she makes sure it gets to where you need to know. To reach us uh, is very simple. Our number is 908-685-2926. I know that information will be made available to whoever's watching this. And we are always very pleased to work with organizations who want to have a blood drive, who'd like to do a talk about blood donation, the need for blood. And always, this is a very gratifying thing that we find working with the community. The hosts who have us are, are always pleased to do a tremendous community service. This is a direct life-saving impact. It's really neighbor helping neighbor. Could you repeat that phone number again? Sure. Our number in the, for Robert Wood Johnson Somerset Blood Services is 908-685-2926. And is there a website? Sure. You can reach us at www.rwjuhdonorclub.org. rwjuhdonorclub.org. You can make individual appointments or learn about our upcoming blood drives on that site as well. Okay. So... You said something that I just want to ask about. You said that when other companies, when you see trucks, it's being sold, the blood is being sold to the hospital. When people donate to the hospital directly, is that different? And what is the difference? Right. The difference is that's a unit that, that's being directly served to the community in which it's being donated. Other organizations, um, and, and it's interesting when I talk to people, this is something I personally didn't know having been a blood donor for many years until I, I took on this role. But the larger organizations, they do sell. It's a commodity. Um, so making this gift, the gift of life, is directly, directly helping patients in the hospital you're giving to. Okay, so the best way to have a drive is to go through the hospital directly and contact you. Yes. Okay, and is there a size, a minimum size group that could put on a drive, or could it be any size? Well, typically we, we like our, our drives to be about 30 units, um, 30 people signed up. Um, more is always, always great, of course, um, but if it's, a, if it's a small group that wants to do something, we're not going to turn someone away. We can, we can work out an arrangement where we could hold the drive even in our blood donor room. Um, we don't even have to be limited to make it a one-day thing. We can create a campaign with a group. Um, the nice thing about our, our, our program is that we have the flexibility to work with each group individually. This is not a cookie-cutter thing by any means. I wonder if groups would want to get together, friends, as a celebration of life, maybe at the anniversary of something that they've been through, if they could get a group together to celebrate life by having friends and family donate blood. Have you ever done anything like that? We have, and they are so gratifying. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful expression. The, the, the vibe in the room is it's a celebration. Um, the, these are people who understand the, the meaning of, of, of being a patient, being on the other side of being a patient, and in many cases, we'll, we'll work with families who will come and donate because their family member received treatment this way. Um, it, it's a very, very encouraging thing. And, and that excitement's really contagious. That's great. That's great. Um, now, my second question to you is, I personally have a chronic autoimmune illness. 
uh, for, and I always thought I couldn't donate blood. So d could you clarify, now my condition is not, it's genetic, but who can and cannot donate? You touched upon it a little. Are there clear cut restrictions? Do they change often? How does someone know if they could or cannot be a donor? So we're, we're informed by, by a pretty strict set of guidelines, and that's governed by our medical director, but also with guidance from, from the FDA and the CDC. Um, and these questions are really always handled on an individual basis. Um, communicable diseases obviously are, are an issue. Travel to malaria, areas that are known to have um, potential for malaria exposure, those are right off the bat. But individually speaking, um, it, it's hard to brush with a, with a broad stroke. Um, there are many different types of autoimmune diseases. Some are acceptable, some are not acceptable. Sometimes it boils down to the medication you're taking. Um, it, de it depends on whether you've had a flare or not. That's always best really to bring these questions. Don't self-limit, but, but always, you know, it's best to bring these questions in. Every donor is, is evaluated as an individual, which really is a helpful thing because if, if we're broadly disqualifying people or letting that get out there, most people will continue to self-limit. So each, each donor is, is viewed as an individual and each case is looked at. That okay. And then what is the process like? So could you schedule a time to come in to donate blood? And how does that work? And what exactly happens when you donate blood? What's the process like? Yes, you can schedule. We encourage, walk-ins are always welcome. We are open Monday through Friday. We have some evenings we're open later. Walk-ins are welcome. Um, appointments are encouraged because we know you're busy. Going back to that statistic about New Jersey with less than 3% of eligible people donating, we know you've got places to go and people to see. So uh, making an appointment by calling 908-685-2926 is always great. We encourage that. The process itself is four very easy steps. And you come in, we'll do your questionnaire, you'll meet with, with a member of our, our team, uh, we'll, we'll do the screening questionnaire, you'll get a mini physical, blood pressure, we'll look at your blood iron, temperature, you can, we can send you home with those results so you know where you stand physically. Come in, have a seat for the collection, and step four, snack and any, anything that involves a snack step is always time well spent. So it's just four easy steps. And then what happens to the blood after it's donated? <laughs> so once it's collected, um, it'll be filtered, and then it will be spun down and it's separated into components, so red cells. Wait, you know what, I'm sorry. If you could just move over a little bit, we can hear you, okay. <laughs> Can't hear me or can't see me? Yeah, that was better. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, like I said, we, we filter the blood as soon as we get it. We remove some white cells because we don't want people to have reactions with white cells. And then it will be spun down and we'll have the red cells component and the plasma component. Um, and then they are processed and tested. We're viral test all our units uh, for hepatitis, syphilis, um, Chagas, West Nile, Zika. Um, make sure they're safe for our patients. And then the plasma that we collect after it's labeled and processed uh, will be frozen. And it, that is good for a year. Uh, so we can save that and defrost it anytime we need it within the year. The red cells are only good for 42 days. Um, and they will stay at room temperature or, or refrigerated, um, mostly refrigerated, uh, for the 42 days. And we can just pull them off the shelf and use them when needed. Um, have processes changed of screening blood since blood over the past decade or so? What are the processes that have changed and have they improved at testing. screening out possible First conditions? Testing. The testing, sure. We're always adding new testing on. Um, years ago, we didn't test for HIV. Now we test for HIV. Um, we're also working on a test for uh, Babesia, which is a tick-borne illness, uh, which can be transmitted. 
So um, we're, that's in the testing phase now. All units are tested, but it's still not FDA approved yet. Um, and as things come up, the West Nile, we started testing. Zika, we started testing. We just keep adding on to that. That's great. Okay. Um, family donation. If someone wanted to donate to a family member who's in the hospital and needed blood, I my thought was that it's too last minute to donate. Is that right? Because it's a bit of a process, or is that something that you do? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the process takes about three or four days um, with all the testing, so um, we would need that time. Um, so it's best if you think you're going a family member is going to need blood, you know, donate as soon as possible. Um, you can also replace units later, so they can use bank units and then they can um, donate in honor of the patient. Oh, so, that's a great idea too. You know, and if the family member, if they do anticipate they want to look into that, they need to work with their you know, family member and their doctor because those units are union prescription. We, we do need for the directed donation, yes. Okay. It's always and also, a, I'm it's sorry. A it's a purposeful thing if you're in the hospital and you're waiting for someone having a procedure. And we've all been there. We, we, we understand the waiting room and, and how tense that could be. But it's, it's very meaningful to donate blood to replace if they might need it. But also, it's a good use of that time just to kind of contribute to, to somebody else who in the hospital might need it that day. Okay. okay. Um, what is the rarest form like what is the rarest type of blood that you might need the most or what type of blood what blood types are needed most well all blood types are needed because we have all types of patients here um, but the o is our our favorite as we said because it can be given to anybody it's a universal donor so even the person with the rarest blood type could receive an o unit so ab like an ab neg would be the rarest blood type but they could receive an O-negative unit if needed. Um, but all blood types are always needed, especially during the summer. Uh, recently, we've had an O shortage um, because people are just aren't donating enough during the summer. Uh, so we, we take any type, any type at all. And also, could you talk a bit about platelet donation? What's unique about our, our hospital and, and our donor program is that we work uh, very closely with patients in the Steeplechase Cancer Center. So many of our platelets that we collect are transfused to patients there. Um, it's, it's very meaningful for us because we share a campus. So we understand the need here very much on campus. Platelet donation, um, as Cindy had talked about, um, there are components to blood. Uh, when the blood is separated, it's broken down into three parts, platelets, plasma, and red blood cells. Platelets are, are used to, to clot um, cancer patients in their treatment that depletes their ability for their body to, to do that naturally. So they're often infused with platelets. Um, other patients use platelets as well. Um, the process of donating platelets is, is a bit different than, than giving whole blood. Um, what, what it, it's, the process is called apheresis. And what you do is when you're connected to that collection apparatus, the, the blood is removed from your body. It's spun in a machine right next to you. Only the platelets, or depending on, on what you are, are donating in that process, only the components you're donating are extracted. The rest is returned. I call it the robot vampire. It's a very, very, very interesting thing to watch. It's a bit of a longer process, but many donors find that actually they feel stronger than if they gave a whole unit of blood, um, just because only the parts that were needed were taken, the rest of the fluids are back. So the process itself takes about an hour and a half, but those units are very, very much always, always needed. No, we all, always need platelets because we only allow, are allowed to keep them for five days. So we have a constant need, constant need. Um, they only survive for five days. Wow, so interesting. Can we, uh, if anyone has any questions, you could post them. In the meantime, 
can you end with some examples? Well, first of all, on one side, have you been in a situation where someone needs blood and you just don't have it? And what, what happens, what do you do in that situation? And then on the flip side, some examples of when blood has completely saved lives. Hmm. Okay. Um, yes, I've been in lots of situations like that where we've needed lots of blood and we just don't have the amount that we needed. And we're continuously ordering, ordering from outside sources because we don't have it here. Um, we get some from New Brunswick, um, if they'll let us have any from um, American Red Cross and from New York Blood Center if we have to. Um, we had one patient um, not too long ago that ended up needing 45 units of blood. And it was very stressful looking for the blood. <laughs> and it, we took a lot of people because we didn't keep continuously order. And as the blood comes in, we do our own testing here to make sure it's safe for the patient. And we were lucky, um, very lucky. The patient had a very good outcome. Um, he survived, and um, we were very happy when it was over. <laughs> but yes, it's very stressful when, when we don't have the blood here on our shelf. Um, so that's why we just, we need so many donors. And beyond that too, when we have to go to outside sources beyond our, our sister hospital in New Brunswick, there's a cost associated. So we would have to purchase those units. Um, the city had mentioned going to purchasing from Red Cross, New York Blood Center. Um, these units cost hundreds of dollars each. So there's a significant cost attached to that. Um, it, it's obviously the priority, of course, is, is giving the patient excellent care. That's number one priority. But when we can provide that in-house as best we can, that's always a win for everyone. And it gets to the patient immediately, always. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel in medicine uh, that there's some things we don't know, right? There's some things that are still uncurable, untreatable. This is something we do know, and we know it saves lives. It's really just all of us coming together to make an effort to learn the facts and to take action. And it doesn't take a lot of time, and you could work around people's schedules I love the idea of life celebrations and getting friends and family together to donate blood, but I really encourage everyone listening to really give it thought and hopefully spread the word that blood is needed right here in New Jersey, in your, at your local hospital, and wherever you are, blood is a consistent need. You may have someone like the patient you said who needs 45 pints of blood and then that would deplete the whole a lot of your supply. So I want to thank you for taking the time to talk about this. It's so important and it's something that I'm sure in our busy lives people don't always stop to think about. And it doesn't, does it, is there any costs associated with donating blood? Not, not, no, not on, not on the donor's end. And, you know, what I like to tell people is it's, it's wonderful. It's a tremendous gift to donate. But if you're one of the people who, for any reason, you can't donate, you can always recruit. And there's no limit to the number of people you can, you can bring in. There was a very famous statistic um, that is very common among blood recruiters 37% of people who have not, who came in to give blood for the first time said, oh, I'm just doing this. It never really occurred to me. I never thought about it. That, that's, that's a lot. If 1% more people who are eligible in America gave blood, there would be no more shortages. So when 37% of the public who decide to come and give blood say, oh, I just got around to it. I never thought about it. That tells you the disconnect. The, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have these shortages if, if somebody could get in their ears, spread the word, raise awareness, it will absolutely save lives. We can attest to that. So this should be the official kickoff to the Donate Blood Challenge. We'll spread the word on Facebook or in social media, share this video, and let's all get together and donate blood to have a huge supply that will save lots of lives. And thank you so much. Thanks for the work that both of you do and all of you at the hospital. Thank you. Thank you thank for you. spreading the word. Thank Thanks. you.